Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. It's Tuesday, August 30th, 2022. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host here, Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Well, when it comes to beer and uh, talking about influencers and important people, Ale Sharpton, uh, based out of Atlanta, is one of them. He's been on the show a few times. And um, I was looking at some of the projects he does because he's always at, at the pulse of what's going on in terms of beer and culture. So, uh, Ale Sharp is joining us today, and, and he's got a few other guests coming on, too. So, Ale, uh, l- let's say hello to the, everybody, and um, let's catch up about what you've been doing. What's up, Beer Sessions people? I am Ale Sharpton, and it's an honor to be with you once again. Shout out to you guys, and thanks for doing what you're doing to the beer community for more than a couple decades now. So, I appreciate you. It's an honor to be here. Well, thanks, Ale. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it starts with Piano Keys, um, that's an amazing project. Thank you. And we're going to talk about what you're doing in the craft beer world, um, also with black culture. But you stand out. You, you know, you are a number one, a craft beer icon. Thank you. Uh huh. Yeah. Worked hard for that, brother, but I will take it. Definitely. Oh, yeah. So t- just tell us about the, the Piano Keys project, a little bit about Atlanta, too, because um, it, Atlanta's changed a lot. I think there used to be a 6%. Yes. cap on ABVs. A little bit about how you got started in, in the craft beer world in Atlanta. Uh, as soon as I moved here from finishing school at Cornell uh, to Atlanta, the the beer scene was archaic uh, due to the, uh, the the laws that were basically limiting them from really creativity and really expressing and showing creative muscle uh, in the beer scene because it was a limit. Yes, you're correct, at 6%. And I had to help change that through writing, through lobbying, because uh, I knew once Atlanta and Georgia, for that matter, raised the um, ABV limit, that uh, it would open a floodgate for a lot of uh, breweries and a lot of creativity and a lot of brewing styles, because then you're not limited to just keeping things 6% and under. So um, it worked. Uh, in 2004, the law was passed, raising it to 14%, and Atlanta was everything I thought it would be in terms of a uh, really um, reputable beer city. And now there's so many breweries. It's definitely one of the most, if not the most diverse uh, beer city in terms of especially black uh, involvement. There's a lot of smaller breweries opening up. Lantucky just opened up, Hip and Hops. Uh, Lantucky's with uh, the Nappy Roots, and then Hip and Hops now has three locations. Shout out to Clarence on that. So uh, it's amazing. Atlanta is, I love showing it off. Mike can attest to this. Mike Potter, who's joining us today. And um, now with the concern of Piano Keys, New Belgium, who know I've been doing this for uh, more than uh, two and a half decades, uh, asked me to be a consultant and help drive a kind of a diversity initiative. And it, uh, I said, yes, I'll take it. 
uh, I'll be consultant. And they didn't know what project I want to do, but I said, they flew me out there to Fort Collins and I sat with them at the executive table and I said, we're going to make a beer. They're like, well, that's cool. I said, yeah, you're one of the best breweries in the world. Why not do that? So we're going to make a beer. Beer brings good people together. And they said, okay. And then I came up with the concept. The concept would be an imperial chocolate stout, chocolate vanilla stout, ebony, ivory, black, white. So then I called it Piano Keys. I'm all about music. So, uh, and I want to make a beer that will introduce a lot of people with novices and all who think beer is only bitter, only have the tasty notes of a, of a lager or an IPA, that beer can also be decadent and be um, a certain flavor like chocolate and vanilla and do all these complex things and almost like uh, dessert beer. And it's worked tremendously. It's been a great experiment and it's a fundraiser element involved called uh, Brewgether, which is also dope. I uh, mean, it raises funds to help minority farmers who, who brew or make uh, different types of hops and grains or need help with their farming tools or whatever, raise funds for that, kids who need instruments. Just a lot of the equity uh, type of uh, projects to really help a lot of people throughout the country. Uh, we use uh, grains and vanilla and chocolate resource from Africa, the motherland. So we're getting a lot of stuff from Ghana and um, we've gotten vanilla from, um, we're going with uh, Uganda for that. So, and now I'm at uh, San Fran brewing 5.0 Piano Keys. And that is uh, here in San Fran at their satellite brewery for New Belgium. And it's amazing. I have some friends who visited the show Love, Hello Coastal, which is a Black-owned brewery here in uh, Oakland. And they came through to say what's up. And uh, Ramon is a Mexican brother who helped me make this beer. And then my wife, Andrew, is here who runs together. So it's a definitely a kumbaya situation going on. <laughs> well, you know what? It, it just makes me happy talking to you. You know, there's <laughs> it's the last couple of years has been a lot going on. And, and I love I always love your positive vibe. I have a good friend who's a writer and says, you know what? All I want to hear are, are positive stories. So let's jump to your other friend. So Mike Potter, uh, Al, we were talking about a month ago, and he says, yep. you know what? Let's do a show, but you got to meet Mike Potter. So Mike, just tell us a little bit about, about your programs. I mean, it's like the, the Black Brew Culture and, and Blacktoberfest. Yeah, so uh, Black Brew Culture, our platform, we started in 2014. Uh, we've been advocating for uh, black and, and, you know, minority individuals in the beer industry for some years now, um, trying to blend together brewing, events, uh, panels, discussions, anything that we can do to advance the beer industry as a whole with, with diversity and equity for people of color. And um, it's, been, it's been a great ride. We, uh, we started doing beer festivals in 2018, started a fresh fest in Pittsburgh, uh, migrated into Blacktoberfest in 2020. This will be our third one in, uh, in Carolinas and uh, our first year in Atlanta. So uh, it's just been a positive experience. Uh, met up with Ale. Ale's been a good friend of mine since, uh, since I, we started this platform in, in, in 2014. He was one of the first supporters that uh, we were able to connect with and collaborate with. And he bought into the vision. And so he's always been able, you know, he's always been on board helping us to uh, push the movement forward. So with Blacktoberfest this year, this is our first year in Atlanta, our second year in Durham. Uh, we are up to now 35 collaboration beer, brewer, beers with um, different Black-owned breweries and Black-owned entities in the Georgia um, Atlanta Metroplex um, it's just a, it's an exciting time because, um, as as Al mentioned, Atlanta's probably one of the bigger hubs for cultural diversity, and particularly Black in, influence in the beer community. So, um, it was a pleasure to to link up with Clarence Boston at at Hip and Hops, and set the ground floor um, venue for this year's festival, and kind of just get um, get something historic going with the festival. Uh, in Atlanta. So we're, we're real excited to be involved with that. Uh, today is a really special day because we are here at Dirtbag Ales in Hope Mills, North Carolina, um, with Tito. Uh, at Dirt, he's a head brewer here. Um, and he. It, this is where we brew our flagship uh, Blacktoberfest Mars and Ale. So today we had a great turnout. Um, Nappy Roots came through Atlanta, you know, new new black owned brewery in Atlanta. They made the trek to come help us brew this beer today. 
Uh, obviously, Tito and his crew, very gracious for us to start this beer here. And uh, we're sitting in the room now with Tito, as well as Kelvin from Bill Street Brewing. So these are all uh, uh, Joel Franken from, uh, uh, what is the name? Oh, uh, Halfway Crooks and Indigo Brewing Project. <laughs> All Sorry. right, you, you loaded this up. We're, we're going to get back to them, but I want to hear more, more about you, Mike. So for, I heard about Fresh Fest, and uh, that sounded like the coolest thing that, that, that's come around in a while. Um, how did you start getting involved in, in the beer, the black brew culture and craft beer in general, and um, a little bit about the evolution of your festivals? So we, I just started making beer around 20, 2012 or so, um, got some Northern Brewer kits and decided, you know, hey, we used to own a printing shop uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we said, hey, let's start making beer. Um, so we wanted to, ideally, we were trying to start a nano brewery of sorts. We really didn't know what the heck we were doing, but made 10 or so batches of uh, home brew. And, you know, it, it, it was it was a challenge. So it was something that like, I, I wasn't ready to actually engage in full-fledged. So we decided, hey, let's let's start a platform. Where we can do events. We can expand education. We can expand knowledge of individuals in the in the craft beer industry, and um, that's how Black Brew Culture actually got started. Um, and then the next evolution with with you know the the platform was to hey, now that we know these people are brewing and we know uh, who can actually be involved, let's do an event. Let's do a festival, and that's how Fresh Fest started. That's great. I will say with, with both of you on, um, I remember it was maybe eight years ago, I think Thrillist wrote an article. It might have been Dave Infante, but he was trying to just talk about, you know, how, what, why aren't there any, like, that many black brewers in, in America? Um, but but now it seems like between what you guys are doing and a few other folk and um, Weathered Souls, I feel like I'm getting to know you know, more, more black brewers uh, in the country. There seems like there's more festivals. Um, Ale, you want to take that, start with that? Because I think that's important to talk about. Oh, definitely. It, it, it's it's an ongoing necessary topic. Uh, it needs to keep going until there is equity. And um, Dan, Dan, uh, Fontaine really did an awesome job with that. I remember that thrill list. And I actually contribute to thrill list regularly on the beer scene. Um, it was it, it needed to happen. And it's it's slowly progressing. Um, you know, people say there are a lot more black owned breweries now, but there's a lot more white owned ones. And so that level is still relative. It, it, it's still like uh, progressing the same kind of rate. But the, the point is this, there are more black owned breweries now um, and a lot more presence. And there's a lot more recognition, which is going involved and a lot more people, um, people of color are getting more involved with actually learning that brewing can be a, uh, an actual career. And it can be profitable and something lucrative or not even lucrative, just something, you know, you can have and do for a living um, and enjoy it. So it's more about work. It was really about exposure and getting people experience and knowing that this can happen. So a lot more internships, a lot more foundations that are starting, um, a lot more programs and grants that are being developed, like Dr. Jay Beckham and um, even uh, Garrett Oliver down in Brooklyn has gotten involved. And of course, myself with Rue Gether. Uh, it's just so many things happening. I'm loving to see the progress, but it's an ongoing battle. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with I agree with L 100. Um, when we started, it was it was it was a uh, you know the percentages have gone up, and we've noticed that we've we've played off of that. We've continued to make to try to expand the movement. Um, there's there's many there's there's a there's a lot of of breweries now. Yes, I mean so you know like I said with uh, with the, with Blacktoberfest. And specifically, the beer, the Mars and Ale, that is a platform that we've that we've developed to actually showcase just what we're talking about. Every year, we choose ten different breweries or ten different establishments that are putting in the kind of work that we're putting in, or that are black-owned breweries or startups to uh, to brew that ale and kind of just get the showcase and, and let let the let the public know these are the new people that are entering. And I think you know, largely in part of the movement that we've we've created between Al and I, um, definitely the, 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 the work that uh, Kelvin and Tito are doing as brewers, pushing the movement forward, it's definitely been a lot of uh, addition. I know there's, there's funky time. There's quite a, you know, we were talking about a 1% situation, possibly 60 breweries 
in 2015. Um, I got to I got to believe that that number's up to 100 plus maybe now. So um, that's a lot of nice. That's a nice uh, advancement in a couple of years. So we're just keeping the movement going, and um, you know, definitely seeing a change and moving the needle. Mike, when you were first brewing, what were what were the styles that you were trying to make? Man, listen. So what I I was strictly on Pliny the Elder. We were doing the clone package that they offered, an uh, all-grain clone. And so we tried that about 50 times. <laughs> man, these are <laughs> six, 12 times, man, trying to get that recipe down pat just so we could make an IPA that tasted similar to what that, that clone was like. So uh, the first batch we made was a brown ale. I'll never forget it was the worst beer that I've ever tasted in my life. <laughs> um, I I thought I'd keep it, and I you know at that time we didn't know a lot about beer styles and and how to storage beer. So we thought the longer we kept it, it would age like wine. Man, every day that we kept that beer it got nastier and nastier. And uh, finally, we decided okay, that was a that was a bust. But then the Pliny the Pliny clones and the IPAs that we made. Those are the ones we had the most success with. So um, definitely IPAs are my favorite style to brew. Well, that's great. Hey, well, let's introduce your, the guys that are with you. Let's do one at a time. They can come on and say their names and where they're from, and we'll get them to talk a little bit too. Cool, cool. Well, first I'm going to introduce uh, Tito. Tito is the owner of Dirtbag Ales. Um, I'm not even going to speak much about it, let him, get him do the talking, but uh, one of our outstanding brewers and outstanding supporters of everything that we do. Um, he's very knowledgeable in the industry. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let him talk, basically. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for uh, allowing me to be here in this forum. Um, it's probably, actually, this is my first time actually being on a, just a straight radio um, show. So uh, my name is Tito. I am the uh, owner um, and head brewer here at Dirtbag Ales. Uh, we've been around since um, 2013, um, and we've basically carved out a nice little niche for ourselves here in uh, Hope Mills, North Carolina, just outside of Fayetteville and about an hour southeast of Raleigh. And second, I'll introduce Kelvin. Kelvin is the head brewer, uh, well, actually the owner and head brewer when they do brew of um, uh, Bill Street Brewing in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. Another great addition to our network. We love them and appreciate them. Say hello to Kelvin. Morning, gentlemen. Um, once again, I'm Kelvin Coheim with uh, Bill Street Brewing Company in Memphis, Tennessee. Thanks, Kelvin. So um, <laughs> just just for Tito and Kelvin, just tell us how you guys got started. It's the same, the same as Mike. Like, were you home brewers? Um, what, you know, what, why did you why did you open a brewery, um, Tito? Uh, so. I was actually a medic in the military uh, for eight years before um, starting this venture uh, with my partner, Eric. Uh, we added Jerry along the way, um, but there's there's three of us uh, in total. And um, I just felt like uh, there was an opportunity to put a brewery together and this area was primed for it. There were two, um, two operating breweries that were here that basically kept their beer in-house and um, I set my goal to be uh, not necessarily being a restaurant or a brew pub just to put good beer in front of people and they liked it so eventually we had the tap room um, initially starting off as a contract brewer like there was, there was a lot of hurdles that we we faced going through that entire process um, it took us about a year to actually get our own facility up and running. Um, and then um, after that, it took us, once we got our own production place open, we uh, took about another two years to actually get the tap room open and running properly. And then you fast forward to May 2019, and we we're cutting the ribbon on our new uh, facility right here along I-95 in North Carolina, and we've got about six acres with um, a craft cocktail bar, a dog park, kid park, mm -hmm. uh, two resident uh, food establishments, a uh, covered pavilion, and an 8,000 square foot facility. That's great. You know, Tito, um, there's so many breweries now. What, what, did you have any hurdles that, that last jump, 
you know, to your, your new facility. Did you face any hurdles with financing or, um, you know, regulations or anything? Um, there were a few setbacks that came um, during the actual build-out process itself, but um, I think that the uh, term is we are debt averse here. Um, so we don't, we don't tend to do anything that's going to necessarily um, put too much um, out there so that we don't have to, we don't want to risk all that much. So like when we, when we are building these things and we're, we're making our expansions, they're very carefully planned out so that we don't uh, end up overextending ourselves one way or the other. Um, there are definitely calculated risks and um, so far everything has panned out in our favor and we're eternally grateful and humbled by the uh, support that we've actually gotten from our local community and from from others and it's through great things like this initiative right here that I think that we really kind of gain a lot of support and favor because there was nothing um even close to this, when I started homebrewing in 2010, I, I didn't have a forum to go and look up, nor had I the wherewithal to actually find, you know, the information that I actually needed about brewing and doing these things. So, like, everything I got was from a book and, like, random uh, internet sites. And then we had a single place here in town uh, that actually offered, like, homebrew kits and I just happened to pick up a partial mash kit and I had a good time doing it. And here I am 12 years later and brewing every day. Yeah, he's being super humble, y'all. I'm sorry to cut in. I got I to gotta tell you, <laughs> you, if you're sitting at this facility right now, it's amazing. 15 barrel system. He's got, what, 15 tanks or uh, 10 barrel, t- no, no, 10? There's the fourth. 30s, 430s, four. I mean, it's it's humongous. It it's, it rivals any brewery that I've been to outside of like you know your bigger New Belgiums, obviously, and your Anheuser Bushes. But um, this is a beautiful facility. So uh, Tito's been putting in a lot of work. So we, we definitely respect and appreciate what he's got going on. And he he, he probably be, won't tell you until you're sitting here having some of the beer, having some of the food, enjoying the space. Um, it's 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 incredible here. So, Mike, when you go about putting on your festivals, how did you meet Tito? It, like I said, it was like he, he could tell you. He, he was in his garage, and I was in my garage, and we were both like, hey, uh, you know, somebody, <laughs> somebody, you know what I mean? Somebody mentioned, hey, you got to meet this guy, and we went to his first spot. Had no idea that, we, that we'd be sitting in where we're sitting. But, uh, you know, you, you, you create bonds, you create friendships, same, same way that I've uh, bonded with Kelvin, same way I bonded with Ale. Um, there's a genuine, uh, you know, desire to push the culture and push the, the brewing industry forward in ways that we can contribute. And uh, when you have that common interest, it's easy to make a bond. And, um, you know, he's, he's been supportive when he was able to. When we brought the idea of Blacktoberfest and the Mars and Ale, you know, he was all on board. You know, he, first thing he, uh, he started, actually, and this is a true story, he started ordering ingredients as we were talking and before I even got home, he had already had a brew date scheduled and, and the beer in place. So it's just been, it's just been, you know, dope to, to have someone help us facilitate what we're trying to do. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the answer to that question. And, and Mike, I, I get it with the Marzen cause I, I just love, you know, all the different beer styles. Did, did, is there a certain Marzen recipe or are you leaving that up to the brewers? We, we, we leave it up to Tito it originally came up with the majority of the recipe. We started doing it with uh, honey roasted squash. We wanted to replace the seasonal kind of pumpkin thing with something similar and close. We did that year one. Um, and then the year two, we left the squash out and it just it tasted a little better, believe it or not, without the squash. Squash was pretty good first year, but it, it kind of had a, had a better kick and a better flavor. So uh, we are always exploring. This year, we stayed with the same recipe from year two, changed up the can design a little bit, but the recipe is the same. Um, and maybe next year we'll, we'll, we'll try something different and see if we can do some adjuncts or something, um, you know, something cool. We, we kind of want to stay away from pumpkin, kind of want to stay away from the traditional adjuncts, but 
you know, it's been a great, it's gonna been a great brewing process. Well, Mike, Mike, I, I'm into beer. I'm into malts and hops and water and yeast. So, sure, uh, I gotta try that Martin. Sounds really great. We got you, man. We yeah. got you. And then let, this this festival is exciting, man. Like I said, now that I know you did Fresh Fest, it it really popped up on my radar in Blacktoberfest. So tell me about the cities that it's in, and and how you're going about r- rolling it out. So uh, we just we wanted to make it a celebration, a month long situation. Um, whichever cities that we could grab on board that had the you know had the following, had the the support and the backing of the beer community, St. Louis, Atlanta, and Durham. Durham's our home base outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So. You know, we want to expand this as, as far as we can. Uh, we were doing something with uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. We still are connected there, so we're trying to make this a global situation. But basically, wherever there's a good, solid beer community, wherever we have the support, um, Atlanta obviously goes without saying. We have uh, Atlanta, You know, we've just got tons of support in Atlanta. Um, Durham, that's our home base. We've got tons of support there. And uh, St. Louis is a, is a pretty big beer city as well. Obviously, with you know the staple industry, the the Anheuser Busch's, the uh, Four Hands, the uh, Second Shift, you know Civil Life. There's tons of tons of breweries that have supported us. So um, that's that's basically how we 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 design and how we uh, move forward with where we're going to do these beer festivals at. And Mike, wh- what's next? Is Atlanta next? Atlanta's, the, Atlanta's, well, first on deck is uh, St. Louis, October 1st. Atlanta is the 15th, that's 2nd. And then we close out the whole festival with uh, Durham on the 22nd of October. Wow. So you get, well, we're going to keep talking about the logistics because this is pretty exciting. Uh, yeah. what, let's get Calvin on. I, I haven't talked to him yet. Absolutely. Got to talk to this brother. He's uh, he's doing some big things in Memphis. He's got incredible brand. Um I'll, I won't even interrupt and I'll let him kind of speak on it because he can talk better than I can about uh, about Bill Street Brewing. All right. Good morning, gentlemen. Once again, I'm Kelvin Cohen with Bill Street Brewing Company in Memphis, Tennessee. Just again, Kelvin, tell us how you got started in, in beer and, uh, you know, your interests. What what are some of the styles you you, you like to drink yourself? Um, so I got into beer um, on the cooking aspect. A friend of mine bought me a beer kit years ago, and it sat around for months. Um, finally decided to um, open it up, get it out. Took it to well, I took the grains to a local home brew store. I'm like, hey, this is are these good? They've been in this box. Is it okay? And they were like, don't you? Yeah, they smell okay. But immediately they upgraded me. So um, from the Mister Beer Kit, so got a. Um, was the five gallon system um, started brewing and I realized oh sh- this is like uh, cooking so I, I approached beer from the aspect of cooking and, and just started using a lot of adjuncts and just um, having fun with it similar to cooking so um, once you do that you slap a name on your air quotes home brew system um, and we decided on Bill Street Brewing Company, um, which Memphis was underserved on the craft beer side. So um, let's go with Bill Street Brewing Company. So here we are. Wow. So you're saying Memphis was underserved for craft beer? Yeah, at the time, there were only maybe four um, breweries in the town in Memphis, four or five, to say. And just felt it was um, a need for some more, you know, to do some fun stuff. It, you know, along with some of the other breweries that are brewing there, um, just want to increase the beer scene celeb- and um, celebrate Memphis as well. And, and what do you like? I, I, I know a lot of guys go to Memphis for the barbecue, the Memphis in May event. Absolutely. And uh, what, if I come to visit you, give me a little tour. Where, where, where should I hang out and, uh, and what should we do? Um, first, first stop, Bill Street, downtown, uh, Peabody. You got Stax Museum, Sun Studios. Um, Graceland, Elvis Presley, of course. Um, we got tons of great museums and restaurants. Oh, yeah. So it's unbeatable, right? Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's, right on, it's right on the river, right? It is. And it, like, like you say, Memphis and May is on the river. We have some Sunset concerts, um, barbecue festival, Sunset Barbecue Festival. Um, not to mention the, 
the uh, Memphis Grizzlies. It'll be winning a championship in the next three years. So knocking on wood right now. Let's <laughs> <laughs> start talking about basketball. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then last thing, yeah, the, the Marzen. Uh, t- tell me about, are you just making a straight up Marzen? Anything that you want to say about the beer for Blacktoberfest? Yeah, Marzen is all Tito. He's That's his creation. I am just came to support. Are you, are you working on the brew today with with them? Absolutely. So, yeah, he um, sent the recipe around, and, you know, I gave my thumbs up on it. So, yeah, it was, it was a good recipe. Um, like Mike said, we cleaned it up. We didn't put any adjuncts to um, squash in it this year, so we just wanted to brew a straight, clean beer, a beer-flavored beer. Beer-flavored beer. <laughs> but more importantly, I, well, just as important, I think, we um, the association with the Grizzlies and the beer that you made with uh, John Morant. Yeah, talk about it real quick. So, yeah, we um, we celebrated John Morant um, during the playoff run last year. Um, he calls himself a ninja, ninja. So we did Dark Ninja Rises, um, which was a, it was essentially a West Coast IPA. We call it an all-star, all-star IPA. Um, it turned out pretty well, is what Mike was referring to. Yeah. Had to mention that because it came out, it came out <laughs> extraordinary, man. I shared it a couple times, and I couldn't, I couldn't get my hands on enough to share more. But um, definitely wanted to mention that. Well, you you got a nice community, Mike. I'll go back to Il. We're talking about beer styles. Il, uh, the piano keys. I know a little bit about how, how the first recipe and with and with. New Belgium and and the chocolate vanilla stout. Um, how are you adapting it now? So you're working on Piano Keys 5.0, which is amazing, and you're at San Francisco and the New Belgium there. H- how is the recipe evolving now that you've done it on the fifth time? We're um, starting to freak it a little bit, man. Um, the, the base is delicious, 10%. I appreciate your kind words about it. Um, it's been received really well, received actually. Um, a lot of great uh, feedback and, and high ratings, but that's all about just people enjoying themselves is the most important thing and bringing people together with every launch that it has. So now, like I said, we're here in San Fran brewing a version now where I'm starting to get a little freaky with it. So I'm gonna add some different flavors uh, to the original batch. And not everyone's the same, which is dope about it being a 5.0. I'm glad you said that, or 4.0. Everyone has a little bit of a different malt bill, uh, different chocolate base. Uh, but we stay around the 9 to 10% range. So it's almost a fun challenge to brew it in different places. I've brewed this in three different places so far. So now, um, and a shout out to definitely the brewers who are making this happen here, two women who are killing it, um, and then um, another brother named Ramon who's killing it too. So it's really been a great uh, diversity type of uh, project, and it's just living like that. But this one's going to have a little bit of mint in it. You're the first ones to know. We're going to make a <laughs> piano keys chocolate vanilla mint um, version. And it's not gonna be overly peppermint patty. It's gonna be more on the subtle side so that uh, we avoid that toothpaste kind of um, flavor that a lot of mint beers try not to do but are successful in doing it. Uh, we're gonna freak it though, it's gonna be really fun. So uh, shout out to everybody here for making this a reality. Well, th- thanks, Al. Hey, um, you know, just more about you as a writer because again, you're, you're a craft beer icon um thrillist the the best the best lists um is it always ipa or there are there there different tell us about that that um thrillist i have to give a shout out to because not only are they fun to write for but also really you know when you have to write for different magazines you kind of have to kind of alter to their writing style and their kind of the way they present themselves so some a little more technical than others and um I used to write for a lot of hip-hop magazines and stuff like that, but there's still a little bit of that technicality involved. But with Thrillist, I, I almost speak my voice as if I'm talking to you, and they love that. They embrace it. Uh, so when I write about beer, they really start to evolve into a very strong beer kind of media authority. And uh, no, they don't just do IPAs, but that one obviously gets the most attention because that's the most popular style right now in the beer industry. Um, and Hazy's really blew that up even more because it made it a little less uh, on the hoppy side and all that. You know what I'm talking about there. But um, IPAs get the most love. But no, I just did a pumpkin ales one, and that's a, one of the most polarizing styles of beer you can imagine. Uh, so people either love it or they hate it. Um, it's hard to find those in, a, in between. So that one's out. And then uh, we could do another uh, Best Breweries coming up. 
uh, which is always fun. And I love writing for them because I always look out for the smaller guys and I look out for minority breweries too, uh, minority owned uh, projects and stuff like that and make sure they get a little bit of love in there. So people a lot of times know which ones, when there's certain breweries getting shot out, they know that it's me giving that love and they really applaud that and applaud Thrillers for providing that platform to have these different beers on there. Well, that's great, man. You know, it's amazing how you just ba balance everything because I, I know you're... I'm a Libra. You, know, you are. That, that's it. <laughs> and I have to ask, what's a Libra? I don't even know. Uh, we're but, all about scales and balance, brother. That's, uh, yeah. that's yeah. But, yeah. Well, let, let, this, let, we're going to take one short break. We're going to stay on for a little bit, but take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. Hold on. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Join us and become a member at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. So we got Ale Sharpton and Mike Potter. Mike Potter is uh, running the Blacktoberfest coming up in uh, there's St. Louis and there's Atlanta and Durham, North Carolina. So, Mike, you got you got some great guests on. Um, you mentioned that Kelvin uh, is doing or has made a, a beer with John, John Morant. Um, you know so much about the brewers that you're working with. So why don't you tell me a few more highlights like that? Because it's it's very exciting, right, that, that, that they're able to mix with, like, basketball culture. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for approaching it from that angle because a lot that goes um, over overlooked sometimes and uh, unseen is some of the creativity that I mean all breweries when we talk about beyond the color barrier there's we we're, we're very creative um, when we connect brands sometimes it's uh, it's very easy to you know say okay hey we like doing this type of style <clears throat> excuse me I'm used to drinking this type of style. Let's collaborate. Let's make let's make something happen. Um, so one of our biggest supporters and biggest sponsors, actually, for Blacktoberfest is uh, Killer Mike and Run the Jewels. And we are now in the process of making a collab our second year collaboration with them for the festival. And that happens to be happening here at Dirtbag Ale. So um, year one, we did uh, All Due Respect was the name of the beer. Proximity Brewing Company, which is my startup brewery and Spaceway Brewing Company in uh, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. We did a collaboration with, with Run the Jewels that was really successful. Did a merch launch, uh, very supportive. They've got those guys, to, uh, if you go to uh, runthejewels.beer, uh, I think it's runthejewels.beer, that's where uh, you can see their, their projects. Uh, super supportive of what we're doing. So I guess the biggest project outside of the job rent um, project with uh, Kelvin and Bill Street would be this new collaboration with Run the Jewels for our second year supporting Black Toberfest. So we're excited about that. Well, that's great. And I'm going to go back to Kelvin. Kelvin, uh, tell me more about Memphis and the beers you're making. Come on. 
So we're intentional about celebrating Memphis. Um, our whole tagline is tapping to the music and also beer everybody, which is a play on Memphis versus everybody. But beer everybody is essentially celebrating community through, through the love of craft beer. And when we say community, we, we mean Memphis community. So um, we've celebrated a lot of Memphis where everything is intentional. So we celebrate Memphis on the labels. Um, let's see. We've done a uh, work with Isaac Hayes' daughter, um, eight ball MJG space age sipping. There's a collaboration we did with um, some local Memphis legend uh, rappers. Uh, we did hypnotizing minds with three six mafia. Um, let's see, we did a Memphis mini label. The actual and the actual artist was the great nephew of Memphis mini. She's a, a old blues mu musician. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. What else have we done? <laughs> so we did uh so we just released a um golf course beer called hush maine which is uh celebrating uh the fedex st jude golf tournament where you know when golfers put or tee off they hold a sign to say hush y'all we, <laughs> we flipped it and made it hush maine which was a peach lemonade ale where we um laid in a little chamomile and lavender on top of that so it turned out really nice nice summer ale uh we, we did a bb king themed beer um, called a Thrillers on, um, love and happiness, celebrating Al Green. Uh, right. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, we have several. Yeah, we're intentional about um, definitely celebrating Memphis in the community for sure. Well, that's it's great. It makes me want to go there, man. Thank you. Um, and and Tito, um, more about you and in, in Durham. Keep talking because you you guys are great. And I want to thank Al and Mike for inviting you guys both because. Um, you guys are fresh voices, and I just want to come visit your breweries. Yeah, well, we'd love to have you. Um, we are in Hope Mills, though, not not Durham, unfortunately. Uh, well, not unfortunately. We're, we're actually very fortunate to serve the community that we do. Um, there's actually quite a bit that um, being in the military showed me about this place, and that there was a lack of um, – basically, like, there was, there was no connection, so – uh, Fayetteville itself, um, if you didn't know, you'd probably just skip right over it um, for the for all intents and purposes. Like most people don't even think that anything good comes from here. Um, and that's because for, I guess, as long as or since World War II, this place has only been known because of Fort Bragg. Uh, coming from the military, I was uh, able to at least navigate somewhat like I knew that that sentiment and um, so it kind of guided what we were trying to do and trying to bridge that gap between this um, very much transient community that comes through here that doesn't necessarily feel connected but they carry the like you know that they're it's the same people from all over like any town USA um, we have folks that are that join the military at 18 years old and they come down here and they spend 20 years of their life serving their country. And then they want to make it feel like home. So like, what is, what does that mean to folks? That means like spending your money locally and getting out there and seeing the things in the community that you want to see. So we focus a lot on um, bringing folks out in that community service aspect and also drawing um attention to multicultural events throughout the year, um, being able to host things like uh, Juneteenth and uh, this coming weekend, we have a Puerto Rican uh, festival coming up. And it's, it's all of these, these things are all just immensely rewarding. And I mean, I'm, I'm coming, I'm not from here originally, but I chose to stay here in the hopes that uh, I could do something positive in an area, I guess. And um, I'm, I've been very fortunate to, to have that and and to experience it and to see it come to uh, fruition. Yeah, man, that's great. Yeah, if I, can, if I can add on to that real quick, I know Tito, he's a very humble guy. One of the things that uh, I'd, I'd love to bring attention to as far as what he brings to the table as a brewery, um, he's, he's covers every style. I think there's 20 beers on tap. Um, again, he's not mentioning, he's very humble in, in, in regards to sitting in this brewery and looking at the, the, the size, the square footage of, of what they have going on here. 
but 20 different brewery, I'm sorry, 20 different beers, roughly. So it covers every style, so something for everybody's interest. And uh, again, he talks about just being involved in community development projects. Um, if you had a project that is some of, of some concern, military-wise or other, um, you, you don't have to talk long before he's on board and supporting. So uh, that's a big deal because, uh, you know, these projects need, they need funding, they need support, they need visibility, they need voices. And Tito's been, even though it's it's out in Hope Mills, which is close to Fort Bragg, close to Fayetteville, um, nonetheless, the, the six acres that he's landed on, having this uh, space for people to, to come here and, and push their projects, it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. So again, make, it, make note of brewery-wise, beer-wise, he covers every style and he makes them well. And the fact that we can brew our March, our Blacktoberfest projects here is, uh, it, it, goes, it's, it speaks volumes. Well, that's great, Mike. I just want, I want to just go around the room uh, for one last question, a simple question, your favorite beer style and what, what beer you might be drinking this week. I'm going to start. I'm drinking right now. I, I'm, I'm loving lagers. I'm drinking OEC Brewing in, in Connecticut. They use a traditional German system, um, but it's a cool ship lager. And um, it's just got that little edge to it that I like. Um, Mike? Uh, look, let me go last. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Start with Kelvin. All right, Kelvin here. Um, I'm a I'm an IPA guy, West Coast, hazy IPA, session IPA. I'm a fan of IPAs, and of course, love a great lager. Can't um, leave those out, but I like stouts and porters, um, sours. And I didn't mention we did a peanut butter banana porter celebrating Elvis Presley called King's Ransom last year. So that was one beer I failed to mention. Um, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of flavor, so I like to try all types of beer, sours, um, gozas, um, saisons, you know, I, I like anything. But if I'm going to order some first thing, it'll be either IPA or a lager or, or crisp um, golden ale or something like that. And then Tito? Hey, uh, so for me, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of saisons, actually. Saisons are, like, right up my alley. Um, and... I just recently noticed that I had a can of a Birds Fly South um, mixed cultured saison downstairs. I think that'll be my uh, my, my Saturday sipper. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. You ready for you me? You go, Mike. You go. Right, uh, <laughs> so right now, uh, I agree with uh, Tito, and I agree with both of these guys on their styles. I'm a saison guy. Uh, rocket science, though, as as far as the IPA and uh, full steam. And uh, in Durham, they're killing it with me. Um, I'm not a big hazy person. I just like the basic old school IPA, the original um, stone IPA type style. Um, so definitely shout out to uh, to Full Steam with that rocket science. I, I want to go back back to Kelvin for one minute. Alvin, you mentioned Elvis Presley. Okay, what is it about peanut butter with Elvis? Well, peanut butter banana um, sandwich was his favorite sandwich. So we. We made a peanut butter banana beer celebrating him. That's good to know. I never. I, I used to have my old menu in New York. This thing called the Elvis tea sandwich, mm -hmm. and and, I, and it was it was a grilled cheese with just peanut butter, bananas, and honey. Oh yeah. But I I never knew the story. I, I don't really know too much about Memphis. So yeah, that's that was his favorite. That was his favorite combination: peanut butter and banana um, sandwiches. All right, and then ale. Let, let's close it out. Let's. Uh, you know, you're 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 out there. You're on the pulse. You're in San Francisco. You know yeah. what? What are you drinking out there, man? <laughs> so I bet all my boys on this show right now could answer this question for you as far as what I drank. But I am definitely a, a West Coast IPA kind of guy. Um, Hazy's did their thing for a while, but I I don't want IPAs I can chew. I'm all about <laughs> uh, nice clear IPAs that have that hot profile, but the key is balance. Um, and this one I'm drinking right now. Um, I have to give it a shout out. I said this is one that's phenomenal. It's called Something About the West Coast. And they only brewed it here at uh, New Belgium. And this is only a, this is a limited edition joint. But I'm definitely crushing this. But whenever I went to the stores, I definitely grabbed me a Blind Pig and Pliny from Russian River. That kind of style profile is how I get down for the most part. So 
Atlanta has a great, doing a great job of making a lot of beers kind of in this kind of wave. Um, you know, uh, three taverns and uh, creature comforts and breweries like that uh, are really, really killing it right now. Um, Atlantucky's doing a hell of a brewing job too. So I'm open, but overall, I, I sleep better at night and wake up better in the morning when I have an IPA that's uh, kind of West Coast forward. All right. Listen, uh, you know, you know, whenever I talk to you, we always meet some great friends, and, and it's very interesting. Um, I can't wait to meet you all in person and, and to hang out. Um, are you going to be at the Blacktoberfest, Al? Oh, man, it's in my city. I had no choice. <laughs> um, I had to get it down. My ATL is really, I really brag about it, love showing it off. Uh, every brother who's come to visit me, um, has they know how I get down. And uh, you had the full invite, you and your team, uh, to get an ale sharp and red carpet treatment. But I will be there. I have a, a couple of beers I'm working with, and um, I'm just here to be the I mean Mike's uh, support and uh, make this thing happen. Well, also way overdue in Georgia, your friend Todd had Good Word Brewing, um, so we're, we're definitely going to oh, yeah. come back. Yeah, <laughs> Todd and Ryan. You know, and let's have Mike close it out, Mike. One more time, tell us about the, the, the dates and cities for upcoming Blocktoberfest. Cool, man. Uh, we have October 1st in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, got a great lineup for that one. That's probably our smaller footprint. But we go big, big, big in Atlanta on the 15th, October 15th, Saturday. Um, man, got about 35 collaborations, 20 Black-owned breweries tons of activities and then we close out the month and the whole season of about blacktoberfest in durham on october 22nd um 10 to 2 p.m i'm sorry 2 to 10 p.m are the time frames for each of the festivals um look forward to seeing everybody all the support all the uh conversations look forward to everyone meeting up at each of these cities uh can't thank you guys enough for having us on and promoting this festival I think it's great for the beer community and um, we're appreciative of uh, everybody's involvement, particularly Ale. Can't say enough about his uh, his involvement. He's been, um, you know, phenomenal and in, in supporting us since day one. So uh, let's uh, come out and have a good time. I got you, brother. Thank you, guys. One one last thing, Mike. Shout out to you. Um, Martin as a style. I love it. Thanks. I love that you're dedicating it to Martin, which is a great classic style and I'm going to come try. At some point, I'm going to try the Dirtbag Martin. So thank you guys so much, Al, Mike, Kelvin, and Tito, for joining me here on Heritage Radio Network. Big shout-out to our engineer, Armin Spengen, and producing intern, Alex Tron. I'm Jimmy Carboni. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Thank you, guys. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food Radio is supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.